we are, a whole new way of doing this here for you. Something that's a little bit different. As we're going to be looking at a very interesting place in Scripture that involves so much. It involves angels. It's going to involve ministry. It's going to involve abuse and torture. And it's going to eventually, at one point, lead to murder. Doesn't that sound like a great, sounds like something Hitchcock would write, right? Almost, almost seems like something he would do. So let's, let's just kind of dig into this a little bit here. And before we completely go head over heels into this part of our text, I'd like to introduce you to a man by the name of Sir William Ramsey. I'm sure you guys know exactly who Sir William Ramsey is. In case you don't, here's his face. Okay, here, here's Sir William Ramsey. And let me just tell you a little bit about this guy. He he was knighted in 1906, so, so he's dead now, okay? Just letting you know, he's not still living, okay? He was knighted in 1906. He was an archaeologist, one of the best archaeologists in the history of humanity, as a matter of fact, especially in the area of Asia Minor. This dude would, had received nine honorary doctorate degrees, awarded the gold medal of Pope Leo XIII, original member of British Academy, awarded the Victorian Medal of the Royal uh, Geographical Society, the Regius Professor of Humanity at the University of Aberdeen, world-renowned expert on Asia Minor, three honorary Oxford fellowships, gold medal from University of Pennsylvania, gold medal from Royal Scottish Geographical Society, and a professor of classical archaeology at Oxford. Okay, now why? <laughs> Big dude, right? Okay, this is a dude whose credentials and paper just awe and shocks and humbles even the most experienced and most educated. Just the nine honorary doctorate does it all by itself, let alone everything else. Okay, so this is a big dude, big, big dude, academically speaking. The leader in the 19th and early 20th century of archaeology, especially Asia Minor. He was a non-Christian and doubted, completely doubted the accuracy of the Bible. In fact, he specifically set out to disprove the book of Acts. Hence why I'm talking about him, because we're in the book of? Oh, good, you know where we are. Excellent. Okay, we're in the book of Acts. And he wanted to disprove Luke as an author, the book of Acts specifically, because a lot of Acts took place in, in, some of, in, in Asia Minor, and he wanted to deal with that. So he set out and spent 15 years of his life academically to disprove the book of Acts. Here's was his conclusion. He wrote this, the more I have studied the narrative of Acts and the more I have learned year after year about Greco-Roman society and thoughts and fashions and organization in those provinces, the more I admire and the better I understand. I set out to look for truth on the borderland where Greece and Asia meet and found it here. You may press the words of Luke in a degree far beyond any other historians, and they stand the keenest scrutiny and the harshest, hardest treatment, provided always that the critic knows the subject and does not go beyond the limits of science and justice. He goes on in other parts of this, of this text, ends up saying that Luke is, the, is a historian of the greatest rank. He is the a most amazing uh, to be placed among the greatest of all historians in history. And because of his research, after be concluding after that 15 years, he accepted Christ as Savior and believed the Bible to be completely true. Okay, now why go through this? Because I want you to know a very important thing, a very important statement. If you really take nothing else today away, take this away. Okay, that the Bible, Christianity, a life in Christ, is not just some morality. It is not just some ethic. And it is more than some idealistic philosophy. What it is, is that it is truth and it is history. Okay, it is truth and it is 100% historically accurate. It is history. Jesus walked that history. Jesus died in that history. Jesus rose again in that history. Jesus ascended into heaven in that history. Jesus forgives sins in that history. Jesus restores lives and redeems lives and changes people from the core and the fundamental part of their being within that history. All recorded, by the way, and demonstrated in the book of Acts. Because Acts even starts with Jesus having been resurrected and appearing before his apostles and then ascending into heaven and sending the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter one and two. 
And if the world of history leading expert says, I did 15 years with all my education to prove this to be inaccurate and all I can find that it is 100% accurate, you know it's true. You know it's true. And what we're gonna be dealing with today is some very hard to believe concepts, especially in our society today. And I want to start by saying what we're about to read is true. It's one thing to say, I believe the Bible to be God's word. And it's great to be able to say that because that is a true statement. But if someone says, why do you believe it to be God's word? And we can sometimes say, because I do. At least now we have a little bit of, because I do, because it is, and that's been validated by, and you guys can quote Sir William Ramsey. You're welcome. It's called apologetics. Have fun with that. Okay, so knowing that, the reason why this is going to be awkward is because we're going to be dealing with angels. And that's controversial in our society today. You talk about religion, people will get upset, won't get upset, whatever, tolerate, untolerate. They'll get a little frustrated, but they'll, they'll deal with you. You start talking about Jesus, and they go, okay, I don't want to deal with you as much. Oddly enough, you start talking about angels and demons and Satan, and people go, wow, you are out there. Okay, at least Jesus we can historically point to. At least the early church and Christianity, we can historically look at a makeup of, and we know that they were real existing things. That's fine, but angels, demons, that sounds like mythology. That sounds like something out of a movie. Really? You're going to believe that too? And so we're going to have to deal with that in this passage, okay, in this very, very passage. So let's start digging into this a little bit and see what's taking place. Here's where we have been left off. The Holy Spirit had uh, descended upon the early church. People were given various gifts and abilities to communicate the message of God. And they were preaching with boldness and courage and with conviction. It's been amazing. But the religious leaders of Judaism have not been appreciating that so much. They haven't been liking it because all the attention, all the authority has been moving to the early church and the message of Jesus instead of the religious leaders. And the government in power, Rome, has been saying to the Sadducees, who are the religious leaders on top right now in Judaism, they are the ones that hold the high priest's position, Okay, the Roman government told the Sadducees, as long as there is status quo is met, as long as there is peace amongst the people and everyone's following everything the way it's supposed to be, I, we will keep picking the high priest from you guys. We'll give you guys all the tax breaks, all the benefits, all the good houses, all the parties, all the freedom, all the power, it's yours. And so the Sadducees want to keep that. The early church is coming in, acting like they're going to disrupt that take that away by moving people away from the Judaism religious religion and move it to following Christ, who the Romans helped with the process of having killed. Okay, so, so this is upsetting. So the Sadducees are wanting to stop the message of the early church, wanting to stop Peter and the apostles from proclaiming Jesus. So they arrested Peter and some apostles, told them, quit preaching about Jesus, and then released them. And then what did Peter and the apostles do? They started preaching. They said, cool, we're free. We can preach again. So they started preaching, and they got arrested again. And that's kind of where we're at here, is dealing with the apostles going in and out of prison. So here's what happens. Verse 17 of chapter 5 says, Then the high priest took action. He and his colleagues, those who belonged to the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. So they arrested the apostles and put them in the city jail. But... I love buts. Okay, <laughs> I need a prayer phrase. I love, I love, the word but means something's about to change. What happened before doesn't really matter because what happens next is what's important. Okay, so I love buts, especially big buts. And this is the big but, and I cannot lie. Oh, come on. <laughs> okay, I love buts. So, but an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail during the night, brought them out and said, go and stand in the temple complex and tell the people all about this life, a.k.a. preach. <laughs> in obedience to this, they entered the temple complex at daybreak and began to teach. Now, this is where we need to pause for just a moment and maybe a little bit of an excursus here because doggone it, who was it that opened up the, j the jail doors? An angel. an angel, okay. So the Lord sends an angel. Well, that's exciting. So let's talk about this for a little bit. Let's go ahead and do a little bit of angelology 101, 
Okay, and yes, it's actually a real ology. I didn't make that up. It really exists. Okay, you got demonology, angleology, or angleology, and on and on it goes. So uh, let's talk a little bit about angleology or angelology, if you'd like. It's just not really pronounced well that way. So a uh, couple of things I just want to point out that the media today sends a very important mixed message. This is very important to realize so we understand the battle that the church today is up against. On one hand, on one hand, the media portrays angels like little babies, right? With little wings, okay? On one hand, that's, that's what we get, little babies with little wings, okay? That, that's one of the pictures they give us. They also give us pictures of, of a big, tall, glowing women that are like a look-alike to Marilyn Monroe and, and just kind of ready to, to walk around with blonde hair and blue eyes going, oh! Okay, and, and we get that type of, of a picture as well. Just crazy, crazy pictures, totally misrepresenting angels. Okay, totally misrepresenting them, especially since, as far as we can tell, of the seven types of angels, only one has wings, and there's six of them, and that angel would not appear like, they, like the other angels would. They are staying in the heavenly realms for the most part. So, angels would not have wings. So, we kind of have a big misconception. But nonetheless, that's what the media shows. And they also teach that in, when you die, you become one, right? You die, you get wings, and you sit on the cloud with a harp and a halo, okay? And I just thought, harp and a halo, uh, that's not interesting to me. I don't want a harp and a halo when I die. If that's what death is like, I don't want it to come. If that's what heaven's like, I don't want it. Maybe harpo playing halo, but I don't want a harp and halo, okay? <laughs> that's not what I want. And if that's heaven, I don't want it. It's just, I'm being honest, okay? I'm being honest. And, and so here we have this mixed message, though. You die, you grow wings, you have a halo, and you play a harp, or you're a baby with, a, with, a, with wings, maybe a little bow and arrow with a heart on the end, right? You know, look, come on, we just had V-Day yesterday, right? <laughs> And so, uh, so we, th this is the message that they send. But then they send another message. Another message that says that if you believe in angels, you're stupid. There was a TV show that's on, I believe it's Showtime or HBO, one of the two called uh, Network. And in that show, there was a clip that's been seen by millions of people all over YouTube and on Facebook where Jeff Daniels has given the speech about how America is not the greatest country in the world anymore. <laughs> it used to be, but now it no longer is. And he gives reasons why America is not the greatest nation in the world anymore. One of the reasons is that America is the leading nation in the world on the on those who are incarcerated per capita and leading the world on the number of people who are adults that also believe in angels. Okay, and he gets, it's a really powerful speech. It really is. Some of his observations are very amazing. And I looked up, some of them are actually right. Some of them are skewed data. Uh, but but some, it's just a really powerful speech. And on the other hand, that part of it gives us a window on what the media is doing. It paints a picture for that everybody knows. Here's what angels are, little babies, little mythical things with wings on a, on a cloud with a, with a halo and a harp. And they give all of these pictures that are not right. And then they say, if you believe in angels, you're an idiot. And then the church is left by saying, well, we believe in angels, just not those angels. We believe in a different type of angels, but do they hear that? No, they hear we believe in angels and leave all the rest of the data out. And they say, look, here is Christianity believing in mythology, believing in, in fancifulness, believing in sci-fi, believing in, in stupidity, storybook tales. Okay, and so th that's kind of where we're at in a position here. And it's an awkward position, wouldn't you agree? Okay, it's an awkward position. So I would like to take a moment and help us to unlearn angels just a little bit and relearn it according to the Bible, who never once indicates that angels are babies. Who never once indicates that angels are only, you know, a couple feet tall. Who never once indicates that there's these little halos hanging over them and that they're playing like, they never once, are they described like that. Okay, so I'd like to unlearn our angelology and relearn it 
based on scripture alone. And there's a lot you can learn from that. There's a book out there that is called uh, uh, what, 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 to, or what Do You Believe? written by Little. That's a good book to get. Or there's another book called The Theology for the Church written by Aiken. Another really good book. Has a whole chapter just on angels and spiritual beings that, that really decon- deconstructs and puts together a beautiful picture according to scripture only and letting us know where historically the false stuff has come from. Some of the teachings we get on angels are actually from the Apocrypha. Some of it is from other pseudepigraphas and other collections of works that are not the Bible. Some of it comes from uh, old medieval Catholic uh, manipulations and trying to get people to give more when they were having a financial downpour. And so on and on, these books help unpack that, which is nice, and then gives us the proper picture. A really good, at least those two books are, are my two favorite for those. Those are really, really good books. So here's just a little glimpse, a 101, real top, real surfacy, not getting too deep because we want to really dig into Acts, not just this topic. I thought about just doing this topic for the whole day, and I thought, eh, I'll point you to those two good books, let you do some reading. I'll just get you started. First off, I like to point out that the existence of angels are taught by Jesus himself. This is vital. The same world that says adults should not believe in angels and the ones that do are idiots are also the same people, almost in the same breath, would even say Jesus was a good person. He wasn't God, but he was a good person, and he was a good teacher. But Jesus taught the existence of angels. So when Jesus teaches creation, Jesus teaches angels, it becomes a really strong point to make that, hey, if you believe that Jesus' teachings were good, he taught these things. Kind of FYI. So Jesus taught that angels existed. Here's just two from the book of Matthew. Okay, two occasions. Uh, We find a little bit in scripture from Paul's writing as well as from Moses, uh, as well as from the book of Job about the creation of angels. The angels as creation are not mentioned in the book of Genesis in the first two chapters when we get the creation account given to us twice. Same creation account, but just worded in two different ways. One as poetry and one as narrative prose. Okay, so we get two accounts of that, uh, but here we don't, they don't mention angels in that, which is fine. We get it other places, like in Colossians and also in Job 38, and we find out, like in Job, that angels were created before the foundations of the world were laid. So either just before uh, day one or at the very beginning of day one, because Job says that when the creation of the world was, was, was made and the foundations were laid, the angels rejoiced. So they were there. So that's kind of important to know that they did have a point of creation. Also important to know that because they were created, and Colossians says that they were created, it's important to know that they are not God. Therefore, they are not to be worshipped. They are a creation just like we are a creation. We're made in the image of God. They are never described that way. And they are a creation just like we are a creation. So they are not to be worshipped. They are not to be praised. Okay? God is and God alone is. They have a personality, and just, just a few examples of this. They have intelligence or an intellect, 1 Peter chapter 1. They have emotion, Luke chapter 2, and they also have a will, Jude verse 6. There's only one chapter in Jude, so we don't usually say one verse. We just say verse, because that's all there is, or just a handful of verses. So they have a will, a desire uh, of their own. This makes sense. Satan was an angel, and Satan rejected God and rebelled against God. And so that's another ind- indication of angels having a will. There's also an organization about angels. Okay, there, there, there's a, It's not like a hierarchy, but it's interesting that there are different types of angels, different classifications. And it's hard to put these in order, because... To try to understand angels would be like trying to tell a tadpole what it's like to be a frog. You're just not going to, you're missing a lot of data. Maybe on the new earth we'll understand it better or at least have the potential of learning it better. But until then, we're kind of limited on what the Bible tells us. The Bible gives us seven classifications. We know there's seven classifications. We know, for example, that two are named one is Gabriel, and the other one is Michael. Only Michael is called an archangel. Gabriel is never called that. He's called an archangel in the Apocrypha and in other non-canonized pieces of literature, but not in the Bible. Okay, so we know that we have Gabriel, we know we have Michael, the other ones are not named. We know that there are some that are called the chief princes. That's in Daniel chapter 10. We know that there are some that are called the ruling angels, Ephesians chapter 3. We know that there are some that are called the intervention angels, Hebrews 1, Matthew 18. This is where we get the conceptional idea of guardian angels. 
Okay, so it's not that every person has a guardian angel, but sometimes angels are those that are sent to intervene in times of danger, and sometimes not, and danger happens. Okay, so uh, we know that there are some that are called seraphim, as plural. Their seraph is singular, seraphim is plural. Uh, the seraphim are the ones that are predominantly uh, all about worshiping God. These are the ones with the six wings two of which to cover the face, two of which to cover their, their feet, and two of which to fly. And they are the ones that are praising holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Okay, and then we have the cherubim, or plural of cherub. These are usually called the baby angels. They are not. Satan was called of the line of the cherubs, and he is far from a baby. Okay, why they did cherub as baby, I have no idea. I'm still trying to find a historically accurate uh, origin for that misconception. A lot of theories, a lot of stuff, not worth going into because in the end it's irrelevant. They're far from babies. It was a cherub that holds a flaming sword in the book of Genesis protecting the Garden of Eden. Okay, these are like warrior angels that are guardians of God's holiness. These are angels you do not mess with. They are tough. Okay, these guys are tough. I, I, loved, I love cherubim. They're, they're just fascinating. Uh, elect angels, 1 Timothy chapter 5. Now, these are the seven classifications. Now, I wonder, I'm hypothesizing, I think I found, this is breaking news, I think I found an eighth class. I think that historians have missed it, Bible scholars have read over it, I think there might be an eighth class of angel. And I think we get a hint of it in Acts chapter 5. Uh, are you ready? I know you're just like, I could tell you're just, some of you are just geeks. Some of you are like, oh great, here we go. It's whatever this is going to be, who knows. But I think, I think, I, I shared this with the class that I teach at Cornerstone University. We actually went through a, a whole class on angle, on, 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 on ongology, and I, I, I shared this with them. They thought I, I, I was on to something, okay? They were like, wow, I never, never, wow. Okay, that's kind of what they said. <laughs> So, the new class of angel is the ninja angel. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> That's funny stuff. Coming soon to a theater near you. Um, <laughs> but think about it, though, right? You got Acts chapter 5. An angel shows up, picks locks. Doesn't that sound like a ninja thing? could be CIA angel, but that sounds like a really mushy romantic song. I wanted something more power than CIA angel, you know, and so I'm like ninja angel. And, and so he shows up and he picks a lock and he doesn't disturb the guards. The guards aren't even asleep, they're awake. And the angels get in and they rescue the apostles and shut the door and they leave and the guards don't even know what happened. Doesn't that sound like a ninja to you? <laughs> Doesn't that sound Chuck Norrisy? Right, doesn't that sound great like that? Like you just got this, oh, I let you out, you go preach, you know? <laughs> it's just, I can see it happening. Okay, maybe not. But nonetheless, there's, there's different classifications of angels. Uh, and then lastly, the ministry of angels, what they're about. The word angelos is the Greek word, it means messenger. So sometimes we find the word angel in the Bible and it's not referring to a spiritual being at all, it's referring to a messenger, Okay, it says angela simply means messenger or angel. So that means that giving a message is predominantly one of the chief roles within angelic existence. It's one of the chief parts. Beyond just being message bearers, we have specific attributes that are part of their ministry I'd like to show you. Like in Hebrews 1, the general ministry of aiding, that they aid people and they help them out in various ways, that they're encouragers, and they sometimes give encouragement. In chapter 27 of Acts, we'll see much later, uh, that they give encouragement in times of danger. That was actually a very dangerous time, and the people were in serious trouble, and the angels showed up to give encouragement. Um, they also have, it's a weird case, Jude verse 9, on the care for the righteous at death. Okay, this is where Moses was dead, and the angels showed up to care for his body, and they start fighting for the body of Moses. It's a very interesting, curious passage. Maybe someday we'll be able to go through Jude verse by verse. I have the research done for it, just got to type it up. So it's a great, great book, short little book. Maybe after we're done with this whole series, depending on how things go, might be able to go through that as a brief interlude. 
And we also find that they are announcing impending judgments, like in Revelation 14, where they're used to show up and they announce what God's about to judge. And they let people know that judgment is coming. Okay? And then we also find protection in the times of danger, like in Acts chapter 5 where an angel shows up and they rescue someone from danger. Okay, now this does not always happen. Sometimes an angel shows up and sometimes an angel does not. In fact, most of the time, angels do not. But sometimes, on those rare occasions, when God really wants something to be taking place, he sends an angel on his behalf to get involved, to do some things, so that the message can continue. Because one thing that God guarantees is that his word will not be silenced. Individuals, preachers, and speakers can be silenced, but his word will not be. And when you have the only preachers being locked up on all the face of the earth, God's going to get involved in that. And he let them, had the angels come let them out. So that gives us a little glimpse over to the existence and life of angels. Now, we can go from our excursus and get back to the situation of Acts chapter 5, where the apostles are in prison. Angel shows up, lets the apostles out of prison, and tells the apostles, hey, I know you guys were arrested for preaching. Now I've released you from prison. I want you to go and preach. And by the way, this is great evidence that the Bible was not made up, because who would do this for a fake story? Who would get arrested, get released, just to keep doing the exact same thing like that and preaching unless they were all sold 100% in on this because the apostles are going to eventually be murdered for their faith and they are going to die proclaiming Jesus. Okay, that is an amazing issue, an amazing issue. So the apostles are now out of prison and they are preaching. So now we get comedy moment. It's like the Keystone Cop moment now. Okay, this is where Charlie Chaplin shows up. Uh, This just gets great, where the religious leaders are now going to have to deal with (laughs) the apostles gone, okay, because they're going to want, like, bring the prisoners forth, (laughs) and some poor schmuck is going to be like, oh, no, there's no one there, and it's just a great moment. I think this would make a great movie. I really, really do. Check this out. So starting at the second half of verse 21 of chapter 5, when the high priest and those who were with him arrived, they convened the Sanhedrin. So they get everybody together. The full senate of the sons of Israel. So this is like all of Congress convening about dealing with this one group of people. Okay, this is just all of who's anyone is anyone shows up. This is great. Okay, so they sent orders to the jail to have them brought. Them referring to the apostles that were in jail, not the Sanhedrin. I can show you your grammar's lined up there. We had a break with our excursus after all. But when the temple police got there to the jail, they did not find them in the jail. Oops. You know, what would that be like for you if you were the temple police and Mr. Big Hat tells you to go and do something and then you go to the jail to get somebody out of jail and the door's closed. The door's locked, the guard's standing there, everything's normal. You unlock the door, you open it, and it's empty. There's no tunnel, there's no big poster of a movie, you know, of, of Shawshank. You know, there's, there's no spoon, there's no window busted out, there's nothing. It's just a hole in the earth. No way out, and you're, they're like, oh, snap. You know, I was hoping for a race. <laughs> you know, they're, you know, you're going to come back kind of, I picture they're like, um, Mr. Big Hat, <laughs> sir, um, I have a report, <laughs> you know, and so they come back and they returned and reported, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing in front of the door, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Oh, no. I'm telling you, this is a great moment. I love this. As the commander of the temple police and the chief priest heard these things, they were baffled. <laughs> no lie. Because they put them into the jail themselves. Locked it themselves. They, they saw it all happen. And now they're missing? What happened? So they're baffled about these details as to what could become to, of this. 
someone came and reported to them. <laughs> it's like Barney Fife shows up. Okay? <laughs> and says, ah, there's new information. <laughs> them apostles, their mouths are certified lethal weapons. <laughs> Okay, so someone came and reported to them, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple complex and they're teaching the people. <laughs> they're at it again. <laughs> they got out. They didn't get very far. They went right back to where you arrested them and they're doing the exact same crime. They're preaching again. Okay, <laughs> then the commander went with the temple police and brought them in without force. <laughs> Notice that. Without force. It's like they showed up and the apostles are preaching, apostles are preaching, her, her. Crowd's going, yeah, I like this, wow. You know, and then the police and the Sanhedrin people show up and they're like, hey. And they're like, uh-uh, well, we knew this was coming. <laughs> it's fine, okay, let's go. Kind of grab them by the hand, let's, let's go. We got to talk to you guys, okay? But they did it without force because they were afraid of getting killed by the crowd. Because they were afraid that people might stone them. Yeah, because the people love the early church. After all, the early church is, is sharing with them the forgiveness, <clears throat> teaching them about Jesus, and some of them are even getting healed. They were unable to walk, and now they can. Unable to see, and now they can. Miraculous, unusually miraculous things are happening. The people love the apostles, so they arrest them. But without force. After they brought them in, they had them stand before the Sanhedrin, and the high priest asked, didn't we strictly order you not to teach in this name? Notice he won't even say the name. Notice he won't say Jesus. I just want you to notice that. All throughout this, the only time it's mentioned, the name Jesus is mentioned in this is when Luke tells us that's who they're talking about as the author of this, okay? So didn't we tell you not to? to teach in this name. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to bring this man's blood on us. You're determined to make us responsible. That's what that phrase means, but there's irony here. You see it? You're determined to bring this man's blood on us. That's exactly what they wanted. That's exactly what Jesus wanted, was for his blood shed on the cross to be able to be shed for them, to be on them for the forgiveness of their sin, for them to be responsible for their own sin and to come to Jesus as the savior of that sin. It's exactly what Jesus wanted. It's exactly what the apostles wanted. And they are missing it. And they're missing it. You're trying to be determined to make us responsible. You're trying to bring that man's blood, again, they aren't saying Jesus' blood. It's interesting how sometimes people have a hard time saying the name Jesus. Even Christians have a hard time. They like saying God. They like saying Lord. I'll talk about the Lord. I'll talk about God. But what happens if you say Jesus? Well, now suddenly some people get uncomfortable. So let me just challenge you to ask yourself how comfortable you are with the name Jesus. Now, I'm not talking about a person from Mexico named Jesus. I'm talking about Jesus the Christ. How comfortable are you saying, like going onto Facebook and saying, I got to worship Jesus today? Or do you say, had a good time at church? Or do you just not even mention it at all and just silent about the entire issue? You got other things to talk about on Facebook. I'm not going to talk about Jesus. I'm not going to do that. Something about that name, isn't there? Sounds like a good title for a song. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what the religious leaders do. They bring them back in, re-arrest them. Now comes the response of Peter and the apostles, and I love this. I love this. It's funny. This is funny. Check this out. Peter, out there preaching, gets arrested, told, don't preach anymore, released. Peter gets out there preaching, gets arrested, told, don't preach anymore, going to jail, gets released, goes out, keeps preaching, gets arrested, comes in and told, when we tell you you're supposed to not preach anymore, didn't we tell you not to preach? And Peter literally says, well, since you guys are all here, I got a sermon for you. And he preaches 
to the Sanhedrin. This is awesome. I love this guy. Uh, this guy is awesome. Uh, <laughs> so Peter says, but Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had murdered by <laughs> hanging him on a tree. You're trying to make us responsible. Don't, don't do that. Well, you murdered him. Gotta love that. How gutsy is that? To stand before the Sanhedrin and say, oh, you don't want me to make you responsible. Okay, murderer. You murder. <laughs> I love this guy. Okay, you murdered him by hanging him on a tree. God exalted this man to his right hand as ruler and savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Oh, man, that's a good sermon, isn't it? Especially since it was only three minutes long. <laughs> so you're like, you need to go to his school, <laughs> learn how to preach. <laughs> okay, so this is just awesome. I mean, the boldness, the, 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 the audacity of Peter to sit there and go, hey, Mr. Big Shot, Mr. Big Hat, let me tell you something. You are responsible. You are the one who killed Jesus. And guess what? This Jesus, he's alive. And guess what? This Jesus, he's here to forgive your sins. And guess what? This Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, and we're preaching under that power and trying to stop us from preaching. It's like trying to put your hand over a speaker to make it quiet. It isn't going to work. All of the church could be have that said about them, that you just can't shut them up. Oh, man, that's awesome. The, the audacity of that. And this is civil disobedience as a last resort. That's what this is. We've covered this in the past, that they're saying we would rather obey God than obey men. And that's true. It's civil disobedience as a last resort. Constantly, the Bible is very clear about obey the government, submit to the government. When the government says, be quiet about the name of Jesus, you need to fear God more than men. And not ever be silent about the name of Jesus. So it's civil disobedience, but as a last resort. Just kind of want to make sure that gets put on there. That these apostles and Peter, they're not on Team Roman. They're on Team Jesus. And so long as the two can coexist, they'll live, be peaceful. But once Team Roman tries to say that Team Jesus can't play a game anymore, they need to get off the field, Team Jesus is going to be vocal. Team Jesus is going to be vocal. And that's what's going on, is they're being extremely vocal. Now, what happens next is uncomfortable. What happens next is not one of my more favored topics to talk about. One of the reasons I love going verse by verse through books of the Bible is that I would never pick this verse on my own accord to just preach because it is not a feel-good sermon. It is not a happy passage. And I would not want to cover it. it wouldn't be my, I wouldn't wake up in the morning going, oh, I should preach on that. Instead, I go, gee, I want to preach on that. What's going to give me the boldness to do so? I know, we'll do the book of Acts, <laughs> and no one can blame me for it. Okay, so I love going verse by verse, because it forces us through awkward passages, and allows us and makes us talk about difficult topics. You can't get around it when you go verse by verse. And that is what happens next, and it's this, verse 33. We're going to take it all the way to the end of the chapter. It's going to be long, bear with it. When they heard this, the Sanhedrin, heard this sermon from Peter. They were enraged and wanted to kill them until a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was respected by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered the men to be taken outside for a little while. Get them out of here. Okay, then he said to them, Gamaliel's talking, he says, uh, men of Israel, be careful what you're going to do to these men. Not long ago, Thaddeus rose up claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all his partisans were dispersed and came to nothing. After this, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and attracted a following. That man also perished, and all his partisans were scattered. And now I tell you, stay away from these men and leave them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will be overthrown." But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even be found fighting against God. In other words, if these people, if these apostles, if this early church is not of God, let it play itself out, it will sizzle out. But if it is of God, then we need to accept it. 
Because last thing we want is to have God as an enemy. Okay, that's his offer and advice to the Sanhedrin. So they were persuaded by him. Oh, that's good. They were persuaded by him. They're not going to kill the apostles. So they called in the apostles and had them flogged. Okay, this is a type of whipping with multiple tails, like a, like a cat of nine tails type of a whip, multiple strings. And on the ends of these strings, on the edges of the whip, are pieces of bone, pieces of metal, and different little hooks that when they whip you, it doesn't just whip across your back, it digs into your skin and tears it. Okay, so it wasn't like they walked away with welts. The apostles are now having their skin and flesh, even parts of their side, ripped off their body. People can die from this. Okay, very brutal, very torturous. So they had them flogged and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and released them. Then they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin, the apostles, they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin and they, that's interesting, that's interesting, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be dishonored. See, this is uncomfortable. This is rough. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to be dishonored on the behalf of the name. I love how Luke uses the name like that. If all they could think of, the Sanhedrin, was the name, well, how important is that name? On behalf of the name. Every day in the temple complex and in various homes, they continued teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. I want you to notice how often. How often? Every day. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. We need to kind of build our way to it because there was a lot here that took place, particularly this issue, rejoicing in times of mistreatment. This is not easy. This is not at all easy to try to think that we can rejoice in times of mistreatment. I mean, think about this. Think about this. How well do you take being insulted let alone beaten. I see people on Facebook all the time. They get one little insult, and they're all up in arms. Oh, my gosh, they said something bad about me. They, they posted something bad about me online. I can't believe this. You fool, you idiot. How dare you say that about me? Oh, my goodness, I can't believe the immorality of people on Facebook. Oh, my word. And then, oh, they even tweeted it. They saw on Twitter, and they fall up into a fetal position, lay on the ground. I'm moving to Canada. <laughs> That's how we respond to an insult. <laughs> Am I wrong? Okay, that's how we respond to an insult. And these apostles took a beating, and the first thing they did is post on Instagram a picture of them eating cake, blowing kazoos while missing teeth. Okay, that's what they did, essentially speaking. They come out of this beating, and they don't say, I quit. They don't say, oh, woe is me. Where is God? Why didn't you intervene? An angel released us from prison, but couldn't release us from the whip tails? Thank you, God. I'd rather the cell. You know, they didn't complain. They didn't bicker. They didn't fall up into a fetal position. They did not go and complain all over Twitter sphere or anything else, saying, oh, how horrible these people are. That's not what they did. Instead, they went and they preached. How long? How soon did they? How long did they wait until they preached? They didn't wait at all. We would have taken a week off. We would have called in sick to work. I'm not coming to work today. My body hurts. You know, that's what we would have done. They didn't even take a day off. They left the cell rejoicing, and every day were preaching. I, this boggles my mind, and it convicts me, and it convicts me. Hopefully, it convicts you, because so I read this, and I start feeling like a wuss. 
I do. I start feeling like a wuss because of the times that I have received insults online and my wife can attest how grumpy I've gotten over words. And I feel like a wuss. And it's our natural tendency to then say, I don't like talking about that. I don't like reading about that. It makes me feel like a wuss. To which I have to remind myself, good, because you are. I don't like talking about this, about that guy. He makes me feel like a bad person. Well, maybe you are, and you need to repent. Maybe you are, and you need to grow a spine. Maybe you are, and you need to have thicker skin, because I'm telling you something very, very honest. Very, very honest. Call this instructions for Christians today. We are living in a world where following Christ is going to cost you, and there will be a price to pay. And what are you going to do about it? It is going to cost you. It will cost you friends. It will cost your reputation. It will cost for some of you even the ability to graduate from college. It will cost some of you your job. And this, by the way, have all been things that have taken place in America in just the last six months on more than one occasion. Even in Michigan was a girl denied the ability to graduate from a state university because she believed in something the Bible said was true. And the university said, you cannot believe that. You need to repent of that belief about the Bible. She says, I cannot. They said, then you don't graduate. She took them to the courts and lost and now is not able to graduate with her master's degree. This is happening. The court said, you don't like it? Find a different school, which is what she's working on. People are getting fired. People are getting their reputations trashed. People are starting to, we're, we're, you're seeing it's escalating. It's getting hard even now for people to even find jobs on their own if they believe in the Bible. They publish something about the Bible in a book that they got published or they put it online. Suddenly the the mayor's office is saying, sorry, you can't be chief of police anymore. See, it's going to cost you something. There There is a price to pay. This is not fun, is it? You see why this is a hard passage. And to be able to come across those and say, I will rejoice, I will praise God, I will consider it an honor to get to that place. Can you imagine being there? Oh, it's easy to say, oh, I can be there when I'm not in the place of suffering. It's different when that suffering comes. And let me just be honest with you. Since we're all gathered together and we're here, let me just lay it all out on the line. There are times where our sufferings and our hardships are not persecution and they're well-deserved. Okay, and and some people, they'll say, oh my word, I got fired from the job. I happen to be a Christian. That's Christian persecution. I'm just like Jesus. And Jesus is like, no, you're not. You're nothing like me. You were lazy on the job. You didn't deserve that job. You should have been fired months ago from that job. You're nothing like me. You were not fired because of me. You were fired because you're lazy. Okay, so there are times where somebody may have gotten smacked in the face, and they say, you know what? That was Christian persecution. No, you were acting like a jerk. You know, I'm not for violence like that, yet you were acting like a jerk. It's not Christian persecution. You kind of had it coming. Okay, so they Anna slapped you. You're going to have to deal with that frozen moment because you were a jerk. Okay, that's just kind of the, so we have to be careful when we start claiming persecution, persecution. And people are quick to claim persecution. Jesus even said in uh, Matthew chapter five, verse 10, he said, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Not because of laziness, not because of jerkiness, but because of righteousness. Could almost hip hop that. (laughs) I won't, okay? It's because of righteousness, which means if you're able, if you say, hey, you know what? I have just got dumped by my boyfriend or by my girlfriend because I wouldn't sleep with them outside of marriage because of my convictions to Christ. Or if you say, hey, you know, I got fired from my job because I wouldn't lie on the books because I wanted to be truthful in everything I do in honor of Christ. Hey, you know what? I got slammed and a lot of people unfriended me on Facebook because I talked about Jesus. Then you can say you're blessed, then you can say that there's persecution because of righteousness. 
then you have something to be vocal about. So what are you going to do today? It's going to cost you. And I'm gonna give you a word of encouragement. Word of encouragement. Two things. Noting from this passage of Acts chapter five, two things I want you to notice and we'll be done. I could actually go a half hour now because you think I'm almost over and I have your attention afresh. That's the great thing about conclusions. <laughs> okay, two things. Real brief, real, real brief. One, do not stop gathering together as Christians. Notice what the apostles did the moment they got out of jail. They were always together. They were preaching in the temple courts as a large group, and they even met in small groups in people's homes. They never stopped gathering together. And I know it is real easy to make excuses. My kids are grumpy. I'm extra tired. I was up late. I have a hangnail. I know there's excuses. The game is on. There's fish to find. I know there's excuses that you can try to have to not gather together. Do not make them. Gather together because that's the only support and strength you're going to get. Yes, God will comfort you, and God uses people to do the comforting. So many people say, I wish I could be used by God. I wish I could be used by God. I wish God would just comfort me. I guess God would help me, but there's no one in my life to help me. No one in my life. I'm just so alone. Why isn't God helping me? And I ask, well, are you going to church? Well, no. Do you attend any small groups? Well, not really. Then no wonder. No wonder. You're bringing it on yourself. You're not being persecuted by the church. Do not forsake gathering together, number one. And number two, do not, we must not, we cannot be silent about Jesus. We must not and we cannot be silent about Jesus. And we, we need to be vocal. That's what it's about. And, and there's a lie from the pits of hell, from Satan himself that says, well, I can't talk about Jesus to certain people because, you know, it's not my place to judge them. It's not my place to tell them how to believe or what to believe, and they got their own belief, and I'll just try to be an example and do a, That's a lie. Here's why. The world is in a ship, and it's sinking in the water. Everybody's going to drown. There's one life raft that will get people to shore. That's the Team Jesus life raft. That's all there is. And to be able to say, I don't want to offend them by telling them a boat to get on, that is not being excused. That is not being inconsiderate. It's the only loving thing to do to tell them a boat to get on. To let them drown out of a fear of offending is hatred. That's what hatred looks like. Love says, I will rescue them. And the world is dead in sin. And Jesus is life. We cannot be silent about that. We have no business being silent about that. Being silent about that would be like, you guys ever seen the movie Titanic? Remember those on the scene, and the boat's sinking, people are drowning. And the boats, they go off to the side and they wait for enough people to die before they go and rescue who they might feel guilty about rescuing. And they just kind of watched. And they were villains in that scene. Right? The people in the boat were villains. People watched the movie going, oh my gosh, people are screaming, people are dying, people are freezing to death, and they got room on boats, lots of room on boats for hundreds of people. Why aren't they going to rescue at least some Man, these horrible, these horrible, selfish, unloving people. One lady said, let's go, let's go. And the guy yelled at her, if you don't shut up, I'm gonna kick you out of this boat and let you drown too. And then we say that we're on a lifeboat called Jesus. People are dying in their sin and drowning. And we're saying, I don't have the, I'm not gonna wanna offend, I'm not gonna say anything. It's too uncomfortable to say something. We cannot be silent. We must not be silent. Every day we should be trying to tell people about Jesus because every day people are lost and bound in sin. 
and they need to be set free. And the people who attack you, they are not your enemy. They are captives needing to be freed. Only Satan and his demons are enemies. That's it. People are captives and they need freedom. They need Jesus. And we cannot be silent. We must not be silent. But know this, your open mouth will cost you. I do not want to sugarcoat that if you just do everything God says, everything will be great, and you'll have flowers at your feet, and you'll have money in the air. Jesus is a pinata. Whack him with a prayer stick. You'll get blessings. That's not, li- it's not reality. That's not reality. It will be hard. You will find a price to be paid. You will have to pay a cost. But we have to travel that road. That's what we're about. I want to encourage you today. If if you don't know Jesus as Savior, know him. He is alive. He will forgive sins. He changes lives. He has changed mine. He will change yours. You need Jesus. You need Jesus to forgive you of your sins, to change your life around. You need Jesus. If you already have Jesus as Savior, open your mouth and let her fly. But the world needs Jesus. Does it need spirituality? Does it need ethic and morality? They need Jesus. You have to let it go and let it fly.